like what you see here? Then be sure to subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8, a channel devoted to the history of college football. New videos drop twice a week. Click the card in the upper right corner or the link in the description to subscribe now. And now, on with our feature presentation. How important is it to see? That might seem like a stupid question, but seriously, how important is it that your vision is good? And that if it's not, you figure out a way to get that corrected, either by getting contacts, or by wearing glasses, or something along those lines. Well, however important you may think it is for various day-to-day -day activities, it's even more important if you're a baseball player. It's already hard enough as it is to try and track a baseball being hit off the bat at 100 miles per hour. And it's already hard enough to try and hit a baseball being thrown at over 90 miles per hour that's curving and bending in every direction possible. Now, try doing that when you can't see and when your vision is poor. You can. You just can't. If a batter has poor vision, they're toast. And it almost cost the career of this player right here that you've been watching this whole time. This is Cal Daniels of the Cincinnati Reds. And thanks to the incompetence of the Cincinnati Reds for reasons that I don't quite understand, and you will either by the end of this video, his career was almost destroyed. We're not talking about him today, and remembering him as one of the anchors on some very good red teams throughout the latter half of the 1980s, if it wasn't for his insistence on one thing that the Reds, for some reason, refused to do. And to say that it changed his career forever would be a massive understatement. Because this is the bizarre story behind Cal Daniels, and how a pair of glasses saved his entire career. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, and what exactly it was that Daniels was requesting, we need some context to understand who Daniels was, and how he was playing beforehand. After the Reds drafted Daniels in 1982, out of Middle Georgia State University, he absolutely tore it up in the minor leagues, and was looking like he was well on his way to eventually make it to the show. In 1982, at just 18 years old, he was in the Pioneer League, and was hitting 367 with more stolen bases than strikeouts. By 1984, he already found himself in double-A with the Vermont Reds of the Easter League, and he hit 313, which amongst all players to play for Vermont that season to have at least five at-bats, of which there were 21 of them, was the highest average on the team by a lot. He was a big reason why Vermont ended up winning the Eastern League that season, making the playoffs with a 75-65 and record, and then beating the Waterbury Angels in the championship series. And after tearing it up for a season in Denver, where he had 302 and had one of the highest averages on the team, in 1986, he had done it. At just 22 years old, he found himself in Major League Baseball, which was good because he was growing impatient in AAA in Denver, and understandably so, saying, what am I supposed to do? Every day, I read that left field and right field are taken. What do I gotta prove in Denver? Answer that. What the hell do I gotta prove there? However, there was a problem for Daniels, because after he got the call up for the 1986 season to join the Reds, and finally be a part of their major league organization, things didn't quite go according to plan. In fact, Daniels struggled a ton, to the point where many considered him a scapegoat for the team's struggles as through the first 25 games of the season, they were 6-19, already 10 games back of first place in the NL West. Daniels had a bad error in the field in an embarrassing 8-0 loss to the Montreal Expos on April 30th. He was slow to get to the ball, and his bat was awfully quiet, as in the six games that he played in May, he went just 1-12, for posting a batting average of 0 and a slugging percentage of the same number. His bat and his defense were so bad that general manager Bill Burgess put him on blast and demoted him back down to Denver after just a month in the majors. As he said, maybe somebody has to pay a penalty. Well, maybe not a penalty, but maybe we have to do something drastic to shake everybody out of this thing and send somebody down. Daniels has killed us in four games. I want to talk to the scouts who said he was one of the best outfield prospects in the minor leagues. Are they talking about the same player I'm seeing out there? They must not be. And wow, that is awfully harsh to not just demote a guy, but to flat out say that he stinks, 
and your scouts are terrible at evaluating talent. But that raises the obvious question. How do the scouts get it wrong? How do they get it horribly wrong? Daniels was fine defensively in the minors, and was a heck of a hitter who put every pitcher he faced on blast. Well, as it turns out, Daniels strolled in the majors due to some insane incompetence on the part of the Reds. It had nothing to do with the leap from AAA to the majors that some players struggle with. It was entirely because the Reds were stupid and did no due diligence whatsoever. In September of 1985, after the season was done with Denver, Daniels had a team-administered eye examination, as was standard procedure, and the doctors said that he passed the exam. His vision was good to go. However, when spring training rolled around in 1986, Daniels was complaining about his vision. He was saying that he was having trouble seeing the ball and tracking it and whatnot, and something fell off. So when a player says that to you, what's the logical step to take? Obviously, you administer a vision examination. It's common sense. You have a vision problem, you get a vision test to try and fix it, and see if anything needs to change. And vision tests are super easy to administer, take no time at all, and don't require any sort of advanced medical expertise. At most, an eye exam takes an hour. If it's just as simple as reading the chart, it takes no more than 60 seconds. Plus, the team was administering them to certain players anyway, so it's not even like this is an extra cost. However, for some inexplicable reason, when Daniels complained about his vision, Trino Lowry Star told him that he was completely fine. You passed the exam in September, so you're totally fine and have nothing to worry about. Whatever you're feeling will pass. We won't administer another exam. Now, for many reasons, this is stupid. Number one, it's not like he was complaining about this a week after his last vision test. He was complaining about this during spring training in March, six months after his last vision test. Your vision can absolutely change in a six-month stretch. Imagine a dentist not taking you after your last appointment six months ago because your teeth were fine and clean then, so I'm sure they're fine now. Imagine a coach not deciding to conduct a weigh-in for a player because six months ago, their weight was fine, so I'm sure they're fine now. A lot can change in half a year. Number two, what would it have cost you? Seriously, what would it have cost you to conduct the examination? You've already got the trainer on staff. You've already got the equipment and the tools. It costs you absolutely nothing to have this eye exam conducted. Think of the pros and cons of both scenarios. The pro if you conduct the exam is that if there's a problem with your player, you can fix it and he can perform better thereby helping your team win. The con is that if there's no problem at all, you wasted about 30 minutes, which isn't really a waste because the trainer was on staff anyway and you didn't waste any money. Compare that to if you don't conduct the exam and the obvious flaw being that if the player in question actually has a vision problem, you can't diagnose it and it makes it that much tougher for him to play baseball and succeed at that level. Yet, the Reds decided not to administer the exam. Absolutely genius. However, when the Reds demoted Daniels back down to Denver, Daniels insisted once again that something was wrong, and asked Starr to get an eye test. This time, for whatever reason, the Reds comply with his request. And what do you know? Daniels actually had a vision problem. I know, crazy, right? The man complaining that he couldn't see well was telling the truth. Turns out, Daniels was nearsighted and needed glasses. It was that easy. The Reds insisted that nothing was wrong, even despite the pleas of Daniels. And then, when Daniels was a scapegoat, they finally listened to him and realized that he was actually having a problem seeing. And it's gonna sound crazy, but as it turns out, when you're able to see better, you're able to play a lot better. It's a lot easier to play baseball when you can actually see the ball. Because when Daniels was down in Denver for a month and a half now that he had glasses, 
it was almost unfair to the opposition, because he truly was one of the best hitters in the minor leagues. In the 42 games that he played with Denver that season, after his bizarre demotion, now that he had glasses and could see, he hit 371 and drove in 32 runs, while posting an insane on-base percentage of 50.3%. That's right, when he stepped up to the plate, there was actually a better than 50-50 chance that he would get on base. And this was in 169 plate appearances, so it's not like this was a misleading sample size. It was clear by this point that all of Daniel's problems were solved. It just boiled down to the fact that he physically could not see because the Reds' doctors refused to do their jobs. And once that was fixed, he was good to go. Daniels got called up back to the majors on June 29th playing the second half of the season with the Cincinnati Reds. And to say that he made his general manager E. Crow would be an understatement, because it turns out that Daniels was a heck of a hitter who just needed some help with his vision. In that second stint for the 1986 season, Daniels hit 333 and got on base over 40% of the time, while only striking out 19 times in 57 games. He kept that up in 1987, by hitting 334 in 360 at bats, which was not just the top total on the team, but would have ranked third in the National League if he had enough at bats to qualify. And in 1988, he led the entire National League in on base percentage, as thanks to his 291 average and his 87 walks, he got on base 39.7% of the time. Not only was this the top total in the National League, and not only did it make him the first player on the Cincinnati Reds to lead the NL in this category since the legendary Joe Morgan did it in 1976, but he was so good that only one other player, Brett Butler of the San Francisco Giants, was even within 10 percentage points of him. Daniels ended up having a solid career in the majors, though he couldn't have played longer if it wasn't for the artificial turf at Riverfront Stadium completely destroying his knees. However, he played until 1992, spending some time with the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Chicago Cubs, even getting some MVP votes in LA in 1990. And he still remembered fondly today as a heck of a hitter in his prime before his knees completely gave out due to the turf. Teammate Buddy Bell said on Daniels, he was one of the finest young hitters I've ever seen. He was very athletic and just a sweet swinging hitter who never gave up at a bat. He had a good idea of the strike zone as a young player. He was a popular player. And to think that this almost never happened, if it wasn't for the doctors on the Reds actually listening to their player. It's crazy that it even got to this point. But who knows? If the doctors actually listened to Daniels during spring training in 1986, seeing as he could clearly hit and could play the field now that he could see the ball, maybe the Reds don't start 6-19 in their first 25 and maybe they actually make a run for the division crown. Conversely, if the doctors didn't listen to Daniels the other time, maybe Daniels never gets called back up to the majors, and is remembered more than three and a half decades later as one of the biggest scapegoats and what-if stories in Red's history. So as a word of advice for any doctors and medical professionals watching this video, if your player comes to you and says they have a problem, and it's been a while since the last time you checked them, Maybe it's a good idea to listen to them. If your player comes to you and says they cannot see, maybe it's a good idea to give them an eye exam and test their vision. Just some food for thought. Because the incompetence of the Reds' medical staff nearly cost the great Cal Daniels his incredibly promising career. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.